being a Christian who drinks, takeaways from my first ever barrel pick, and where PD scotches get the PD flavor from. What's up, guys? My name is Chris, and you are listening to the Whiskey Noobs Podcast. And today, we've got listener questions. So this is my Q&A episode. We do these roughly once a month, and you can submit your very own questions on my Instagram, at whiskey underscore noobs. Every Wednesday, I put a sticker on my story. You can reply to that sticker. Put your question, and I will answer it on the show. If you want to jump to the front of the line, you can join the Patreon at patreon.com slash whiskey noobs. Patrons will get their questions answered first, simply because the people who are the most interested in the show and who want their questions answered the most are the questions that I want to answer. But I do try to answer as many as I possibly can, which is why we do the lightning rounds at the end. All right. It's a Q&A episode. You've already heard some of these questions. They're going to be really good ones. You guys have been bringing the heat with these questions. I'm really enjoying it. But... Given that it's a Q&A episode, I do have something else that I do in every Q&A episode, and that is a mystery whiskey tasting. I'm going to be doing a tasting of a whiskey that's been on the show in the past 20-ish episodes, there's your hint, and I am going to give you some notes from it, very brief tasting, and you can try to guess what it is, or at least try to narrow it down to a category, a type of whiskey, something like that. So without further ado, let's do that mystery tasting so that we can get to the questions. On the nose, this whiskey has more fruit than I remember, and then on the palate, you get to a real dusty, kind of peppery type flavor. It still has some nice caramel, some sweetness, things like that, but it definitely has black pepper. It's definitely got a little bit of spice and a little bit of burn. That's all you get right now, because I may have already said too much, but let's get to the questions. I want to add in the beginning here. For those listening or for those watching, I know for sure right now patrons get full video podcasts. I'm not sure if the public gets those yet or not. But either way, if this sounds rather chopped up, I have a horrendous cough. So that is why the editing is going to not be fun for this episode because I can't kick this cough that's pretty bad. So please forgive uh, if it sounds a little bit like chopped salad in between the questions or during my answers. It's because I'm hacking up a lung and I'm cutting that out so you don't have to listen to it. Let's get started though. Do I get any flack for being a Christian who drinks and how do I respond? I would say I get a surprisingly small amount of flack, honestly. I've even met others in the industry who are also Christian. I don't want to say their names. I don't know if they're okay with me saying that or not. But I've met other Christians in the space, and I think the general understanding is there's nothing, and this is for some Christians, some don't believe this, and that's okay. But the general understanding is the consumption of alcohol in itself is not a sin, it's not bad drunkenness and especially excessive drunkenness is a sin. It is wrong. So I always, you'll notice I'm always putting forward this vibe of tasting the whiskey to enjoy the art form, to enjoy the masterpiece that somebody created and not for the drunkenness, not for the buzz. I purposefully avoid the buzz in a lot of situations and I'm purposefully drinking lots of water during these reviews and spacing out my reviews for that reason. So That being said, I would say most Christians don't give me any kind of flack for it. Most Christians haven't said anything to to indicate to me that they have a problem with me drinking alcohol. That being said, there is definitely, there are definitely certain Christians who believe it to be a problem. I would say in my experience, and I know a good amount of believers, in my experience, it's the minority who thinks that any amount of alcohol, even just tasting it, is bad, it's a sin, it's wrong, and that me saying that any amount is okay is basically blasphemy or heresy. Um, And I, I absolutely respect their position. I think that you're allowed to believe what you want to believe. Your interpretation of the Bible is your own. But that is not how I read the Bible, and I don't think that is... I don't think that's what the Bible teaches, and I think that there are a large number of Christians who would agree with that. Um, I think even the you know the Catholic Church being one of the largest churches within Christianity uh, is okay with consumption of wine and things like that, especially if it's not for the purpose of, of drunkenness. I should say probably only if it's not for the purpose of drunkenness. That being said, that's a long-winded way of saying... I actually surprisingly don't get a lot of flack for it, and I think the reason is that I'm not putting forth this partying, taking shots, that kind of a content. I have thought about it, and I have danced on that line before, 
especially when I was newer to it, when I was less strong in my faith and also trying to just do whatever I could to get the views. Um, and I almost went that route and I'm really glad I did not because I don't want to push people that way. I don't think you should be drinking for excessive drunkenness. I don't think you should be consuming very large amounts of alcohol. There's even studies to suggest that small amounts of alcohol are bad for you. So I don't want to uh, push that at all on any of my social media or on my podcast. I am all about whiskey for the art form. I've had people get mad at me for romanticizing it a little bit too much. And that's just how I am. I look at it as an art form. I enjoy it as an art form. I love whiskey for what it is and for what it has become. And that is why I drink whiskey. It is certainly not to get buzzed or to get drunk or anything like that. I think that's why I probably don't get very much flack from other Christians. Uh, but we'll see. I'm sure as the, the platform continues to grow, especially uh, the Instagram and the TikTok have been getting really big lately, and the podcast is just continuing to grow. So thank you guys for that. I'm sure as that continues to grow, the negativity will follow. That always does. But I don't let negative comments get me down. I know why I'm doing this, and I know that the more people that I can pull from the excessive drinking and pull them over to drinking for the right reasons, by my count, that's a win. So that that's kind of part of the goal here. Uh, so thank you for asking that question. I don't get to talk about my faith very often on the show, and I always welcome questions like that. That being said, I did want to mention, I do fall short sometimes. I don't want to put forth like I'm this just greater than thou awesome Christian who never falls. I do. And there are plenty of times you can even just accidentally get drunk or there are plenty of times that I get carried away just like anybody does, but I'm consistently trying to be better and I'm consistently trying to do better. Uh, but I wanted to give that disclaimer that no, I'm not this guy who's perfect and who never drinks and who doesn't go out and have some drinks at the bar with his friends. I'm, I'm not that guy. And I don't want people to think I am or think that I'm trying to put up some kind of a front that doesn't exist. All right. I think I beat that question to death, but thank you so much for answering it because I like talking about those sorts of things. Let's move on to the next one. Can I get into more detail about what I felt? I, I think they maybe meant tasted mixing the Blantons and the rye. So if you didn't see this, this was a video on TikTok and on Instagram, and I think on YouTube as well. I had some Blantons left over from the blind Blantons battle. And I was done for the night. I had to get up and go to bed. I mean, it was late that night. And so I was like, well, I could throw this Blanton's away or I could use it to mix it and see what it's going to taste like. So I blended it with Traverse City Whiskey Company. Yeah, I used their barrel proof rye and I did like a little bit of a blend, roughly 50-50. And I actually really enjoyed it. Now, I don't recall specific tasting notes. I didn't get that in depth. But here's what I will say, and this is the thing with blending. You might think you take this that tastes like caramel, you take this that tastes like baking bread, you put them together and you get like cinnamon roll. That is not how blending works out, and a lot of times it could go the opposite direction. And that had happened for a lot of the blends that I tried on camera. I did, you know, this nice sweet molassesy scotch that also had some fruit forward notes in it, and I tried to put it with this bakery sweet type of bourbon. And when you put them together, you end up with the burn of the rye from the bourbon and then like the malty funk of the scotch and it was just not good. So that being said, when I tried the Blantons with the rye, I thought maybe it would stink and end up being really good. Blanton's a lot of the times I consider so approachable that it could almost be too approachable. It's got this very smooth, very easy to drink profile. And with it comes this almost dulling of your palate. I think that's why a lot of people don't like it. It's almost too dull. It almost doesn't have enough pop. And so then adding in that rye, getting that added spice, and then also Traverse City Whiskey Company's Barrel Proof Rye, it is semi-approachable for a rye, but I think it brought it up that notch that the Blantons needed to be brought up. And so then you had this really nice balance of the Blantons sweetness, uh, caramel, savory sweet. I always say Blantons is kind of savory sweet. You had that with this little bit of herbaceousness. This little I don't remember if herbaceousness is a word or if Bryce just said it on the podcast. But at any rate, you had this herbal note. You had this little bit of black pepper and it really made it pop. Um, and so that's it kind of vague. It's not a three-part review, but that is the vibe that I was getting from it. And that's why I liked it so much. 
And it lends itself great to this next question, which is, what are my thoughts on blends like Keeper's Heart? And so I like home blending as well. I like trying it at home. And if nothing else, if you don't get anything else from trying to blend whiskeys at home, you will probably get that folks like those at Keeper's Heart and those at distilleries that are doing any kind of blends are very talented because it's not easy to do. It's so hard to put a blend together and actually have the different whiskeys accentuate each other and make each other taste better than it is. It's so much harder to do that than you think it's going to be. So Keeper's Heart specifically, they've sent me two different bottles. They sent me their Irish American, which is Irish whiskey mixed with rye whiskey, American rye whiskey. And they've sent me their Irish bourbon cask strength. So that's Irish whiskey mixed with bourbon whiskey bottled at cask strength, which I just did a review of on Instagram, TikTok, all those. And uh, I really enjoyed both of them. I think Keeper's Heart does a great job, and I've, I've gained so much respect as I've tried to do my own blends. They do a great job of exactly that, having the two different whiskeys accentuate each other and make and the good flavors from each whiskey pops out. So I really enjoyed both of them, especially I want to say the Irish American. It's pretty cheap. I want to say it was around the $30 mark. And then the Irish bourbon, it's a cask strength blend of whiskey, and it was still only like 50 bucks. So for the price, I think they do a really good job. I really enjoy it. And more importantly, it's so different that even if you don't really like it, it's almost a conversation piece. I mean, I took it to a Super Bowl party, I believe it was. And it was kind of like a conversation piece, like people trying it and being like, that's weird. That's different. So that's why I like Keeper's Heart. They don't pay me anything to say that. Um, maybe in the future they will because I like them and I'd be more than happy to work with them. But uh, they don't pay me anything to say that as of right now. They just sent me the bottles for honest reviews and that's my honest review. This next question will probably be a pretty quick one, but I wanted to elaborate on it more than a lightning round question. Should bourbon comparisons always highlight rye versus weeded? What this person's asking is bourbons all have a corn base, but they can be high rye, which is usually a little bit spicier. It's usually a little bit more punch, or they could be weeded, which is usually a little bit sweeter, a little bit more mellow. Should that always be brought up? Should it always be highlighted when you're doing tastings? I don't think it should I think you can, but I think it's more important to point out that you shouldn't assume anything because of the mash bill. Uh, I've had people in my comments, when I'm doing blind tastings, mind you, these are blind. I have no idea what it is that I'm tasting. And I've had people comment things like, that's a weeded bourbon. It's obviously going to be sweeter than the other one, and you said it was harsher. I am. I don't know that it's a weeded bourbon when I'm doing these tastings, which can only mean one thing. It's harsher. So I think it's really important to do blind tastings for that reason. And I think it's really important that we don't let the mash bill of a whiskey bias us. Now, at the end of a tasting, is it always a good idea to understand what it is that you just tasted? Absolutely. That's what's going to help you in the future to make some pred predictions. Or maybe it'll be like it was with some of my blinds where I was like, I would never have expected that. That can absolutely be the case. Um, but I don't want it, I don't want to give off the impression that you should focus on that when you're doing a tasting, like this is a high rye, because that's just going to give you confirmation bias. You're going to look for those spicy notes. If you do wheat, you're going to look for that vanilla and that sweet creaminess. So you don't want to get too far down that road. Blind tastings are always preferred, in my opinion, if you're able to do them. It's a little bit of a challenge, but they are preferred. And you can bring it up at the end of the tasting, absolutely learn about what you're tasting, but don't let it get you carried away, and certainly don't, if you see somebody do a blind tasting, say, you're wrong about how that one tastes, because for their palate, for my palate in this case, I'm not wrong. I'm just telling you exactly what I'm tasting. I have no idea what I'm tasting, and I'm telling you what I'm tasting. So I thought that was worth bringing up, because that actually came up in the comments, and I thought, can you seriously be telling me that I'm not tasting that when I don't even know what it is that I'm tasting? It's biases. It's biases that will create that confirmation of, oh, this is exactly what it tastes like. That's what it's supposed to taste like. You don't want that. All right. Skeptical of ordering bourbon online. Whom do you use? I combine this with the question, have you considered doing a bottle of the month type of content? So I'm assuming I know what this person means by bottle of the month, but let's start with the bourbon online. Uh, I don't really order online. 
However, I do now partner with a company known as Mash Networks. They set up a bottle shop for me. If you go to the link in my bio, you can see bottle shop and you can click on it. You can order those, and I trust these guys for sure. I've worked with them extensively. I, I looked heavily into them before deciding to work with them, uh, and they did a great job. And so you can order bottles online through them. It has to be a bottle that's on my shop, so it's typically going to be something that I like. And if you want something, if you want any of those bottles specifically, you can order them on my shop. I will actually make a small commission as well. And that's also the website I'm going to be doing my barrel picks through. So I'm going to do my barrel picks with MASH Networks as well. So I want to say that because I trust them, and they also work with some other influencers who might have different bottles than me. Uh, but you can buy those bottles through my shop, and that leads me into the second half, which is have I considered doing a bottle of the month type of content? Assuming you mean have I thought about like featuring a bottle, I do already do that. So I do feature my bottles on my email list. So what we review on the show goes out in advance to the email list. You can join that if you send an email to whiskeynoobspodcast at gmail.com. Put in the subject line email list or newsletter, and I will add you to it. If you're on that list, you get the bottles of the month that we're going to be tasting on the show. So I do put those on there. In the future, especially when it's craft-type bottles that can be hard to get, I want to use my MASH Network store to put those bottles on there. That way, for you guys listening at home who want to try it and you're like, I can't get my hands on it, then you can get your hands on it. The only downside is you got to pay shipping, but if you're ordering whiskey online, you got to pay shipping. That's just the way that it goes 99% of the time from what I've seen. There are promotions and things like that, but that's the only downside. Upside is I make a little bit of money, and of course, you guys actually get to try some of these craft bottles that aren't widely available yet. MASH Networks is available in a ton of states. They do a really great job with their distribution, so that was one of the reasons I wanted to partner with them. So that is one way that you'll be able to get your hands on bottles that will be on the show for that kind of bottle of the month, the featured bottle type content. And you don't have to. I'm not going to be like handcuffing you guys like this is something you can only get on my store. It's more so if I want to have it on the show and it's hard to find, there's a couple coming up that are that way that I just want to have on the show, then you can get to it through my bottle shop. That's the plan. Definitely going to keep trying to mix in things that you can find at your local stores. But with all the different laws and all the different states, that can be really hard. So that's an important announcement. So join that email list if you're not already, uh, and you can find some bourbons on my bottle shop already. It's in the link in my bio. If you click my bio on Instagram or on TikTok, it's right there. And click that link and check it out. See if there's anything that you want. I would very much appreciate it because I do make a small commission, as I said, and that's just another way to support the show and another thing that's super, super helpful uh, for supporting the show and for allowing me to make this content. Next and last last full-size question. What is the biggest takeaway from the first barrel pick? I combine this with, who do you use to distill and bottle your bourbon? And I combine that with, When's the next barrel pick, which two different people ask. So thank you guys so much for your concern for the barrel picks. I'm so glad to hear that either you bought it and liked it so much that you want another barrel pick, or if you missed it, that you want to try a a barrel pick of mine. Thank you so much for the support with that. Let's break this down one by one. What's my biggest takeaway from my barrel pick? There's so many takeaways, and this is going to sound so corny, but honestly, my biggest takeaway was that I have a stellar audience. I I can't stress this enough. Anybody can say, I didn't expect that to do as well as it did. You can, of course, say that. I can't stress this enough. Myself and Chris from Bourbon of the Week had plenty of very real conversations about our goals. And none of them involved it selling out before it went public. If you don't know this already, it sold out before it even made it to Instagram. I can't thank you guys enough for that, which that typically means that a lot of you, and I've seen some of you, were not just buying one bottle, you were buying multiples of it. We fully expected at least a week, probably several weeks, of trying to sell this barrel pick. We had backup plans in case it didn't sell. Because you don't know. You don't know how your listeners, how your followers are going to convert into customers. So I truly cannot thank you guys enough 
for buying that barrel pick. I hope you all loved it. I absolutely love it. I, If you don't believe me, I bought myself four bottles. I'm not ashamed to say I bought myself four bottles because I like it that much, and I need to always have some of it because it's my first ever barrel pick. But I'm glad to hear that you guys are that stoked about it. I'm so happy that you guys enjoyed it. So that was my biggest takeaway was I'm on to something with these barrel picks, and I only want to do bigger and better moving forward. I want barrel picks from Whiskey Noobs for the listeners, for the patrons, for the followers. I want that to be the bottle that you're so excited to get in the mail. I want to taste as many samples as I have to to say this barrel is stellar, and I want my listeners to be able to get their hands on it. So that was my biggest takeaway is you guys are awesome and I want to do more of these and I want to do a better, even better job. I think we did a great job on the first one. I think it's delicious, but I just, I want to keep furthering it and getting even better bottles for you guys. So thank you one more time. Thank you guys for buying that barrel pick. Who do I use to distill and bottle my bourbon? So this question I'm guessing is about the barrel pick, but that's actually not how barrel picks work. So with a barrel pick, what you're doing is somebody else, for me it was Blue Note, uncut, unfiltered, was the the bottle that we were buying. So Blue Note makes uncut, unfiltered, juke joint bourbon, and they sell it. You can buy it anywhere. But... Every once in a while, there are barrels that taste very unique or much better than the rest of them. So they blend them all together, make them all taste good for a lot of whiskeys. This goes not just for the one that I picked, but for a lot of whiskeys. You blend these all together, you get a consistent flavor. But sometimes there are barrels that are better than the others. And that's where barrel picking comes into play. So then Blue Note sent me over samples, actually through a retailer, sent samples and I tried those samples. I got a taste for a few different ones. I did this with Chris from bourbon of the week and we each picked one patron to help us pick the barrel and we tried all these samples and then we pick out the one we like the most. So that means it's one barrel of blue note juke joint uncut unfiltered that we think tastes better than the others. That barrel, which is roughly between 150 and 200 bottles is then bottled up and we sell all the bottles and it is the quote unquote whiskey noobs bourbon of the week barrel pick that's how barrel picking works so it's not like it's my whiskey as much as it's their whiskey and i picked one that i found especially good and so then i sell that and make a small commission because i am the one saying this i think this is better than other blue notes i think this is better than other bottles and i think you should buy it and so that's how barrel picking kind of works now who does it? It depends. So, you know, you have to have a retailer to sell it. I mentioned I'm going to be working with MASH Networks here in the future. And then it could be any distiller who's willing to work with you. A lot of times you have to have that relationship with the distiller. Fortunately, with Blue Note, I didn't have to. Uh, but a lot of times you have to have that relationship in order to get a, a distiller to allow you to do a barrel pick. Although it is becoming more common nowadays, so you don't need the relationship quite as much. But that's how it's done. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. And for those of you who didn't know what a barrel pick is, because it's new, it's it's a very new type of trend. If you didn't know what a barrel pick was already, now you do. And hopefully that helped explain it. And hopefully that shows you how I expect that we can totally be improving upon this and making just getting stellar picks. I really want to work and build relationships with distillers so that I'm getting really stellar picks for you guys. That's the plan. Now, the last part of that question was when's the next barrel pick? I don't have one scheduled yet, but I promise you it is in the work and there will be more barrel picks to come. And patrons do get priority in order of Patreon tier as the Patreon grows. Right now, as of the recording of this, I'm fairly certain if you join the Patreon, you're going to get a bottle. You can see how many patrons I have on the Patreon. It's highly likely you're going to get a bottle if you join any tier. But as it grows, uh, it will go in order of the tiers. So top-level patrons are going to get the link first, and then the next level, and then the next level, and so on. So it will hopefully be coming up soon. That is the last full-length question that I have. We're going to get into the lightning round, but not before I take one more taste of this whiskey. This whiskey is what I would call a flavor bomb. So this has full-force flavor. I'm not seeking out any of these notes. It, I mean, I'm just getting them. I'm getting the black pepper. I'm getting the little bit of caramel. I'm getting oakiness. Yeah, I'll just tell you, it's oaky. Um, I'm get, I didn't. I couldn't decide if I wanted to tell you that or not. It's also got a little bit of like a creaminess to it, but it's a lot of flavor that I'm not having to hunt out. It comes with some burn. It definitely has some of that black pepper. It definitely has some of that spice on the tongue. 
but it's not overly harsh for the amount of flavor that you get. But you have to like flavor to like this one. That's for sure. You have to be okay with some spice in exchange for that flavor in order to like this one. Now, let's get to the lightning round questions. And every time I get too close to my mic, I feel like I'm a radio broadcaster because my voice is so rough from all this coughing that I just told you about. Now over to Nancy with the weather. I don't know. That was stupid. <laughs> but but that's how I feel when I get too close to this mic. My voice is like so gritty. Is gritty the word for that? I don't know. Anyhow, let's get on to these lightning round questions. That was an aside that you guys didn't need it. Lightning round. Explain the peaty taste from scotch barrels. So peated scotches actually don't get that taste from the barrel. What peated scotch is, is they take the barley that you put into, let's say, a single malt. Let's go with single malt because that makes the most sense. You have barley that you malt in order to make malted barley so that it ferments easier. So you take your barley, you wet it down a little bit, you trick it into sprouting. You're tricking it into wanting to grow. And then you dry it out to cut off that growth, and that is malting. Well, there are a lot of ways you can dry it out. But one such way that was come up with in Scotland, who knows how long ago. I don't know this off the top of my head. I just know that what peating is. At some point, people decided, hey, we could take this peat that's laying around in all of these mud bogs and swamps and things in uh, – swamp's probably not the right word. But in all these mud bogs in Scotland, we could take it, we could dry it out, and we could burn that – and then we can use that to stop the barley from continuing to sprout. And it was discovered very quickly, I assume, <laughs> that doing that gives it this strong, smoky, earthy, peaty type flavor. So that is where the peated flavor comes from. I just realized I didn't answer that very lightning roundy, but it's actually a really good question. So that's where peatiness comes from. It's not from the barrels. It's from peating the barley that they then use to distill the whiskey to ferment and then distill it into the scotch. All right, let's move on. Is chilling whiskey in a freezer strictly taboo? I don't think it's taboo. I think that there are purists who will tell you it's not okay. I'm not that type. Drink it however you like it. What's one whiskey that I would say, if you don't like this, you don't like whiskey? That is an impossible question to answer because there's no such thing. Whiskeys taste so vastly different. I can't tell you the number of times that people I have known have despised a certain one and thought they didn't like whiskey. Then they try a different one that tastes wildly different and they love it. So there's no one whiskey that you can try. And if you don't like it, you don't like whiskey. Favorite Heaven Hill bourbon. If I factor in price and availability, this is going to be a a not great answer because it's so cheap and it's so available. I love Evan Williams, 1783. So that's going to be my answer that might not be popular thoughts on a Yeti wine cup as your normal whiskey cup. Hey, you do you, man. Uh, that actually sounds very man or woman. Sorry. That actually sounds very durable. Like if you drop it, it's not going to break. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I do have some whiskey glasses that I'm a big fan of. If I haven't posted a video about them already, uh, than I will be. And there's one that's coming out here very soon, known as the Diamas Tumbler, that they reached out to me to work with me, and I checked it out to make sure I liked it, and man, I do like it. So there's already videos posted about this as of the airing of this episode, but just a little heads up there if you want something that's a little bit heavier. But nothing wrong with a Yeti wine cup. I think that's a great idea because I drop stuff and break it all the time. I'm a klutz. The next person asked, Blind Taste Buffalo Trace versus Evan Williams 1783. It is very, very close is what they told me. I've not done this blind tasting, but I added it to my list for future videos. I would love to do that. That seems very interesting. The next question is, what allocated bourbon can you not live without? There's definitely not an allocated bourbon that I cannot live without. I love allocated bourbons. I love rare bourbons. It's fun. It's fun to try to find them, and they taste good usually. Usually, they taste a little bit better than what they cost, but there's none that I can't live without. There's none that I've had that I'm like, I always have to have this on my shelf. I try to keep some on my shelf, but there are so many stellar, non-allocated, not rare, easy to get bourbons um, that I just, I don't worry too much about allocations. If I can get them, I can. If I can't, I can't. That's okay. The next person asks, are you a fan of Penelope? And somebody else asked my favorite in the Penelope lineup. I do like Penelope. I've liked what I've had from them so far. Uh, my favorite, I've only had their run-of-the-mill four-grain bourbon, their barrel-strength bourbon, and then I've got Architect, specifically build number six, which is aged with French oak staves. So far, Architect is my favorite. I've liked what I've had from them. 
the bourbons or like the run of the mill bourbons were good. They're nothing amazing, but the architect I really enjoyed. That was like a hit immediately. I put it, I believe on my Patreon, a, a typed out review of it because I do typed out reviews on Patreon, uh, because I liked it so much. So yes, I am a fan of some of what Penelope does. I'd love to try more of it, them. I'm hoping to try more Penelope stuff here soon. Next question. Will I have a female guest noob? I apologize if I missed it. I did have one. I had one female guest noob on episode eight. Uh, if you know who Bryce is, he's been on the show quite a bit. I had his girlfriend Autumn on to have her try whiskey. I think for the first time, or at least for the first time, actually really trying to taste it um, on the show. So I have had her. I am not opposed to having female guest noobs. Um, I think that would be great. There are actually some creators that I might try to link up with and, and have them on the show. But the fact of the matter is the the female whiskey drinking population is very overrepresented in a sense. Uh, you see a lot of female whiskey creators, which is great by all means. Uh, but when it comes down to actually breaking down my demographics, which Instagram, TikTok, they give me those stats, it is overwhelmingly male. So I, there aren't a lot of options to choose from. That being said, as I mentioned, there are some female creators I would like to work with, so I'm I'm not at all opposed to it. If any of those female creators are listening right now, I don't know if you listen to my podcast or not, but shoot me a DM and we can make something work or click the link in my bio where you can sign up to collaborate with me. And there are, there are a few that hopefully we'll see here in the future. The next question, thoughts on Andrew Huberman's take on alcohol consumption? I think Andrew Huberman is a genius of a person. If you don't know who he is, he's, I think, a neurobiologist. He does a lot of brain stuff and biology stuff. Way smarter than me when it comes to the human body. Uh, and I think he's a genius. And so he does say that any alcohol consumption at all is not great. I think it's like two glasses a week is the limit to where you won't see negative results statistically or whatever. Um, and that's what he says. If that's true, I, I would totally believe it. And that's why I always say to try not to drink too much. So Huberman could totally be right. I would love to talk to him about it someday. Um, it's alcohol is in general, not good for you, especially drinking too much of it. Uh, that's why I always say you should drink it as enjoying the art form of whiskey, but I've already beat that dead horse once today. Have I tried river set or blue note bourbons? I've not had river set. I did have blue note. Uh, it was my barrel pick and I loved it. Blue note juke joint, uncut, unfiltered. I tried four samples. All four samples were killer, but the one that I got was the best out of those four for sure. The next question, why is whiskey so expensive compared to other liquors? I'm going to guess you're comparing to clear liquors. So they're, they're clear in the bottle. The liquor doesn't have any color to it. And that is very simple. It's because aging is expensive. You got to buy the barrels. You got to put it in the barrel and then you got to let it sit in the barrel somewhere. You have to have the room to put it and you got to let it sit there for years and years and years. That's probably the main reason that whiskey is more expensive, at least in my mind. There, there are definitely other reasons. There are a whole lot of tax implications and, and things like that that play into this alcohol industry that I don't understand. But I know for certain, aging something, it's not cheap. You got to buy the barrels. You got to put it somewhere, etc. The next question, what advice should I tell my buddies who just discovered whiskey? I would tell them to listen to this podcast because it's pretty great if you're new to whiskey and follow me on all the social medias. Seriously, though, um, I would give them some of the tips from the first few episodes. A lot of the tips that I just walked through with Dreamer Cigars with Adam from Dreamer Cigars. That last episode will be great if you're new, at, new to whiskey, especially if you're interested in cigars because we talk about those as well. So. Those are my tips for the lightning round. What could be added to the mash bill to get bakery or stone fruit? So what could you add to the mash bill of a whiskey in order to get the notes, the flavors of bakery, sweet, or stone fruit? It could be anything. I, it, it, the flavor varies so much. But here's what I'll say. Usually, you're going to get more spiciness with more rye in a bourbon. But if you balance out that rye with the corn, and depending on the aging, depending on the barrel, depending on the rickhouse location, you can get really caramely vanilla-y type notes. Uh, Buffalo Trace does an excellent job of this with the run-of-the-mill Buffalo Trace. Stone fruits, I don't know for certain what combination of grains is creating that. I do know for sure um, I see the darker fruits a lot, typically, and something that's a little bit oakier. You can get that cherry and that almond to come through a little bit. This is just from my experience. This is off the cuff. 
Um, and then also I get stone fruits like peaches and like apricots a lot of times with like rye for some reason. I, I don't know why. And that could just be a me thing, but I, I get it quite a bit. And with uh, Irish whiskeys, a lot of times they'll give me like a little bit of a peach. Uh, Bushmills Black Bush is a great example. All right. I got too in-depth into that question, but it's a great question. So thank you for asking it. Why is a normal bottle of liquor called a fifth? I actually had to Google this one, and I'm glad I did because I learned something. It was an old unit of measurement that was often used for wine, and it was simply a fifth of a gallon. That was the measurement. And so that was like 757 milliliters. So then they rounded it to 750 milliliters, and that is a fifth uh, nowadays, what we consider a fifth bottle size. So fun fact for you. I didn't know that either. I'm glad I learned it. Would I drink plastic bottle whiskey? I would and I have drank plastic bottle whiskey. I had uh, JTS Brown on uh, Instagram and TikTok for sure. Maybe YouTube. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And it comes out of a plastic bottle. Depends on what you're expecting uh, with how expensive a whiskey is. When and where is the Whiskey Noobs listener meetup? There is not currently one planned, but I can tell you for certain, especially a virtual meetup, I think will be a lot of fun. And if it happens, it's going to happen for the patrons, most likely, at least for the first time. It'll definitely be for the patrons because uh, they're paying for that, that personal experience. And I already talked to some of them, and I would love to do something like that. So hopefully we'll make something like that happen in the future. Maybe even some in-person stuff at, like, tasting events, things like that. But that is all. I don't want to give off the impression that's going to be anytime soon. That is all just possible things in the future. Why are rye all over the place and are either spicy or sweet? I don't know, and I don't know why it is, but I will tell you this. Rye is a very versatile grain. Very, I mean, the flavor of it is super versatile in terms of making whiskey. And this person is absolutely correct. They can be spicy. They can be sweet. They can, some of them taste almost plasticky. They have this insane range. Rye whiskeys have this insane range of flavors, which is really cool. The next person says, I wanted to like Four Roses single barrel, but was disappointed. Could it be a bad bottle or a bad barrel? Should I let it breathe? I love Four Roses single barrel. That doesn't mean that you have to. Uh, it could just be that it stinks. But as I always warn with single barrels, you could be on to something. It could just be a bad barrel. That happens. Or not even a bad barrel, but a barrel that tastes different than other Four Roses single barrels. And therefore, maybe just doesn't align with your palate. That can happen sometimes. Do I ever drink Irish whiskey? Yes, I do drink Irish whiskey, and I have had a few of them on the show. Another reason to sign up for that email list if you're interested in trying the whiskeys right alongside me as I'm drinking them on the show. Celebratory bottle of bourbon or scotch for $100. Well, I didn't plan for this, actually. Off the cuff, celebratory bottle of bourbon for $100. This is going to be off a really slow cuff because I need to look around and think. Man, I'll tell you, it's rare that I spend $100 on a bottle. I mean, I got to really want it. For me, and this is a divisive thing to say, around the $70 mark, I love Noah's Mill. That's a divisive one. Some people don't. It's got some spice to it, but I really like it. Um, and then for Scotch, I'm trying to think of anything that I have that's that expensive. Well, I'll tell you what. We are about to have um, Lagavulin 16, which is about $100. I have no idea if it's worth that or not because I've never had it. But I will be doing a review of that soon, so maybe that will be it. We'll see. <laughs> have I ever had Michigan whiskey? Yes. Episode number 77, I had Chris Fredrickson from the Traverse City Whiskey Company on the show. Uh, they are a whiskey brand out of Traverse City, Michigan. We tried some of their stuff as well. Uh, so go listen to that if you haven't already. And I like Traverse City stuff, especially their Barrel Proof Rye. That one's especially good for me. I, I like that one the most probably. The next person says, I like neat bourbon, but I only get caramel or oak. Any tips? Uh, for sure, tips from that last episode that I did with Adam from Dreamer Cigars. Um, trying stuff side by side. Blind tastings, if you can do them. If you can't do them blind, just tastings of side by side stuff, taking extensive notes. Whiskey journals are really good. I actually have a journal page that is the way that I like journal pages to be set up, and I release that to my patrons. Um, anything like that can be very helpful in just digging in flavor wheels, side-by-side -side tastings, and then a lot of the tricks that I do on the show can help with that as well, which hopefully we'll get into some more of those here soon. 
But those are my best tips for right now. Next question is what bottle did I use the cork and pour or what bottle did I use to make the cork and pour intro to this podcast? So in the beginning, the that that noise. I don't fully remember. I remember trying a few to get that noise. I wanted it to be crisp, you know. I I think I ended up with uh, Rebel Bourbon, which was episode number two we had on here. I think that's where I ended up. Um, I don't know if that was the pour and the cork, or I think I actually split it up. I think there was one that sounded better pouring. There was one that had a better cork sound. So I did something like that. Uh, This is when I had very rudimentary technology. So I took it all into my bedroom because it was the quietest room in my apartment at the time. And I uh, got audio insulation and tried to hold it as close to the microphone as I could uh, and recorded those noises. So I'm glad you asked that because that's actually fun to reminisce. It feels like a century ago that I was making, I was recording those, those sounds for the podcast. But I did record those. Those aren't offline. Those are me. I made those. So thank you for asking that. The next question is, when I say spicy, do I mean spicy hot or do I mean different spices? Can I please explain? Yes, I will explain. Uh, spicy, usually in the in the term of the whiskey, when I'm talking about reviewing a whiskey, I'm talking about lots of spices from a spice cabinet, usually. The most common by far being black pepper. And, it, and in that way, black pepper is kind of spicy in the other form of the word. It does kind of get your jaws. But it, I use the term spicy usually to indicate it is harder to drink, but not necessarily out of harshness. Because sometimes people ask me, what do you mean by harder to drink? What I mean is it's harder to drink. Like it, it's not as easy as welcoming. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's alcohol harshness. Those are two different things. So I use spicy a lot of the times if I mean that it's going to bite, it's going to punch, but it's not from the alcohol necessarily. It's almost the flavor that's punching you. So it kind of means spice cabinet, kind of means spicy like hot sauce, but more so in the sense that if you've ever had something that's way over seasoned, that kind of spiciness, not necessarily like a, a jalapeno pepper or anything like that. The next question, what's a good hidden gem besides Pipe Dream? This is another one I have to answer off the cuff. I didn't think to – you know what? No, I do have something for this. I just did a video about Middle West Spirits uh, weeded bourbon, and it's one that's been on my shelf for so long. I kind of liked it when I first got it. I thought it was good, and then it's just – I did a couple blinds with it lately. I've been drinking it lately, and I'm like, this is actually really good. I don't know what it is, but I really enjoyed it. They're in Ohio, just like me. They're down in Columbus, I believe. And uh, I, I really enjoyed it. So Middle West Spirits, uh, weeded bourbon, I've been enjoying a lot lately. I think that's a little bit of a sleeper, and you can find it a lot of places. Next question says, I listened to your podcast. Oh, this isn't even a question. It's a statement. I listened to your podcast from episode one and finished a few weeks ago. Thank you. Thank you for telling me that. I wanted to include that on the show because I think it's awesome. So I appreciate that. I'm glad you liked it enough to stick around this long. I like to think it's only getting better as we go. Um, So thank you so much for that. The next question is, what flavor note have I gotten in a whiskey but I've never gotten in any other? I don't think there's any note that I've gotten and then never, ever gotten it again. I will say rare ones for me are banana and then strong chocolate. Sometimes you can get like a light cocoa. But like a strong chocolatey flavor is pretty rare. I can't even think off the top of my head of where I got that from. And then the most unique one that's kind of a combination of flavors is the Glen Morangi Quinta Rubin that I had. It it had like a dark fruitiness and it had like a chocolatey. That, that one had a good chocolate to it actually. But the way that it all combined reminded me of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I don't know why. Okay, it, it doesn't necessarily taste like that, but I thought that made it pretty unique, and I like it for that reason. The next question is, what is my last two bottles that I bought that weren't for the podcast? This is really bad, but I don't think I have. The, the only one I can think of for sure is Blood Oath. Uh, Blood Oath packed number nine. So I was at the store. They had it. I was in line, obviously, for allocations. They had it, and I was like, screw it. I'm going to do it. And aside from that, I very rarely buy something that's not for the show. If it's not for the podcast, it's for – well, I should say, 
I buy a lot of stuff not for the podcast. But if it's not for the podcast, it's usually for a video, for like an Instagram or a TikTok. But yeah, Blood Oath would be the last bottle. I don't know what the, the one before that was because I, I buy most of my stuff based on what people want to hear me review because I care about you guys and I appreciate your support. That's sappy. Let's move on. <laughs> What's a good entry-level rye? As I mentioned, rye is super versatile. It has all of these super different flavors, different ways that rye can taste. There are two that taste pretty different to me that I would recommend. One of them is kind of hard to get, so I'm sorry. Sazerac rye, otherwise known as baby Saz because the young, the, the less expensive of the Sazerac ryes from Buffalo Trace. I think that's a good entry level one. It's pretty smooth, pretty easy to drink. And then very different tasting than that is the Rocket Top from Redwood Empire. I really like Rocket Top and it has almost this really weird sweetness to it that I like. Significantly more expensive. Maybe that's not entry level, so that's probably not fair. To throw out entry level Wild Turkey 101 rye is pretty good actually. I forgot about that one, but I'm seeing it as I'm looking at my shelf here. So that's another good one, and that you can find anywhere, and it's pretty inexpensive. Last lightning round question, why can a bourbon be harsh and then the next time be mellow? Simply put, it could be the bourbon needs time to breathe, which a lot of people swear by. I sometimes find that it makes a difference, meaning the bottle needs to be open for a while. Uh, or what's much, much more common is your palate condition. Maybe that day your palate is just a little bit fragile. Anybody who's eaten spicy food more than once knows this can be very, very possible. Some days that run-of-the-mill hot sauce that you always use just tastes like flavor. doesn't taste like anything. And then some days it randomly is spicy and you're like, why is this burning me up so much? The same goes for whiskey. Uh, and that can also change the flavors you're getting from the whiskey. So that, it, simply put, palate conditions a lot of the time. That is my last question that I will be answering in this episode, but I will round out the episode with the mystery tasting. I'm going to do a very quick tasting and then we're going to be done for today. Thank you guys once again for the questions. All right. So I think I let it slip earlier that this is oaky and it's pretty darn oaky. You get a little bit of this vanilla cream, a little bit, but then you get a fair amount of black pepper on the nose and on the beginning of the palate, you get this bright red fruit. Um, kind of berry-ish, maybe that gives it away a little bit, because that, that's another kind of rare note. And then you get some black pepper, you get some oak, uh, and that's all I probably need to say or will say, otherwise I'll make it too easy. Hopefully you narrowed it down that this is a bourbon, because I mentioned it's very oaky, it's black peppery, it, it's flavor bomby. Um, you get that a lot with bourbons. If you didn't narrow it, if you narrowed it down to that, that's great. Uh, if you want to know what it specifically is, maybe you guessed it. This is Grizzly Beast from Redwood Empire, which I did review on the show when I had episode 99, I believe. I had the distillers from Redwood Empire on the show, and I wanted to give it another shake. And what it, it is, it is a flavor bomb, man. I'll tell you what. Um, sometimes it's a little too harsh even for me. Not harsh. I shouldn't say harsh. This is a great example. Spicy. Sometimes it's a little bit punchy for me. But when you're in the mood for punchy, man, is it good. I mean, it's got so much flavor behind it. That bright fruit and those barrel notes, you don't get that combination a lot. Uh, and I, I drinking it again this time, I remembered liking it. I am more impressed this time around. Could be, like some people say, because the bottle has sat a while. But who knows? But I really enjoyed it. So... That is the mystery tasting for today. Once again, thank you guys so much for submitting your questions. I love doing these Q&A episodes and the mystery tastings along with the Q&A episodes. But that's all the questions I have to answer. So I will leave you guys with learn to drink, drink to learn. Thank you guys for listening to another episode of Whiskey Noobs. If you need more Whiskey Noobs content in your life, make sure you check out our Patreon page in the show notes. And if you like the show, please make sure to leave a five-star rating or review. It only takes a couple of minutes, and they're way more helpful than people realize. If you want to do tastings alongside the show, make sure you join the email list by sending an email to whiskeynoobspodcast at gmail.com with a subject line that says email list. You'll receive monthly emails with a list of the whiskeys that will be featured throughout the month so that you can buy them ahead of time. You can also find more Whiskey Noobs content on Instagram at Whiskey underscore Noobs and on TikTok at Whiskey Noobs Podcast. Once again, thank you guys for listening. The Whiskey Noobs Podcast does not support underage or otherwise irresponsible consumption of alcohol.